As we know that the Mukubalim, the mystics tell us that the soul of a human being is not a unity. There are different aspects to the soul. And uh, in some systems they will list them as three. Neshama, Ruach, and Nefesh. In other systems they will list them as five. The Ramchal in one place speaks of two Neshamas. But this is an idea, a very well-known idea, that when we speak of the soul, we're not speaking about a, a unity. We're talking about something which may be a composite of various elements. One of the sources of this idea is an amazing Ramban, a fantastic Ramban. And uh, if there's anyone here has come to any classes I've given, I refer to this Ramban on many occasions. The verse is as follows. It says, Vayitzer Hashem Elokim Esa Adam Ofrim in Adam. God fashioned man from the earth. Vayipach Piyap of Nishmas Chayim. And God blew into him the breath of life. Vayihi HaAdam L'Nefesh Chayim. And man became a living entity. That's what the verse says. There's a famous Targum Unklus. Unklus was the Aramaic translator of the Chumash. And the words, Vayihi HaAdam L'Nefesh Chayim, that man became a living thing, he translates it, man became a speaking being. He became a Ruach Memalala, a speaking being. And uh, this is an often quoted Targum Unklus. And everyone says that you see from here that the highest human attainment is the power of speech, communication. And that's very, very interesting. The question is this. Unkelos is a translator. He's not a commentator. He's not a philosopher. He's coming to translate the text. He rarely deviates from the literal translation. Whenever he does, there has to be a compelling reason. The verse makes perfect sense. God blew into him the breath of life, injected the neshama, and he became a living being. Why does Unkelos have to say not that he became a living being, he became a speaking being? So the Ramban says that what compelled Unkelos is the following question. You read this verse, you get the impression as follows. That when God made man from the earth, at that point, before God blew into him the breath of life, what was man at that point? Inanimate. A body. That's what it seems. Then God blew into him the breath of life. Asks the Ramban, where did animals come from? When the Torah describes the creation of animals, where were animals created from? It says in the verse, God brought forth the animals from the soil, from the earth. Were they bodies or were they alive? They were alive. So why was it that when God brought forth man from the earth, Man was inanimate, just a dead body. If by virtue of God's formation from the soil, the horses were alive, the cows were alive, the sheep were alive, so why is man dead? It says the Ramban that no. That man, by virtue of his formation from the soil, was alive. He was alive on the level of animals. He was just as alive as a horse, just as alive as a cow. He was very much alive. And maybe on a higher level, probably more sophisticated in the same way that a horse is more sophisticated than a ant. So undoubtedly, man, by virtue of his formation from the soil, was also a very sophisticated living thing. But God blew into him the breath of life. And that, says the Ramban, raised him to the level of a human. So it wouldn't be correct to say that God blew into him the breath of life and he became alive. He was alive even before that. So Unclus therefore translates the verse as follows. That with God's injection of the breath of life, he became a speaking being. He acquired uniquely human characteristics. <coughs> now, what happens to be, if you study Tanya, 
when we study the structure of the soul, as the Bolatania explains, he even takes this idea a step further. He understands that by virtue of Adam's formation from the soil, not only was he alive on the level of animal, he was alive on the level of human being. He ignores the Targumunculus. And it's clear that Balatanya understands that by virtue of man's creation from the soil, he was very much alive. He was a sentient, intelligent being. The extra that came from above was the spiritual dimension. The dimension which allows a person to connect to higher spiritual forces, to perform acts of great nobility and altruism. That is the element that was contributed by God above. But the neshama that man had by virtue of his formation from the soil was very, very, very much a human soul. Now, let's analyze the corollaries of this. So we see there are two elements of soul. There's an element of soul which man acquired by virtue of his formation from the soil. That is a part of the soul which is bound to his body. It is an aspect of his body. And there's the additional element that was injected by God, the Vayipach Piyap of Nishmas So we ask ourselves the question, we are descendants of Adam Harishan. Where do our souls come from? Do our souls come from our parents? Do our souls come from God? We'd have to say the same thing. That if we have this division within Adam Harishon, the same division exists within us. In other words, the soul that Adam Harishon had by virtue of his formation from the earth, that is an element of soul which is transmitted biologically from parents to children to children to children. And that, in that aspect, we are very, very much connected to our parents. There's an additional element of soul which is the Vipach Piyab of Nishmas Chaim, that is, God injects the breath of life into Adam Harishan. This is a higher element of soul, and that is repeated again and again and again every time a child is conceived, as the Talmud says. That the father and mother contribute the body, God contributes the soul, exactly as it was in the creation of Adam Harishan. That element of soul is disconnected from parents. That is a gift that comes from God. But it's safe to say, I think this is not an outlandish conjecture, that within every human being there are two aspects of soul. There's one aspect of soul which is connected to the body, which is therefore the contribution that parents make to the production of the child. And there's the extra element that God injects, which of course is in a sense disconnected. And therefore, it would seem to me that when we raise the question, is there a connection of our souls to our families in the next world, it depends at what stage of the next world we're speaking. In the initial stage of the next world, which is a pure olam hanashamos, it's a pure soul world, because the body remains buried, and only the soul is in the olam hanashamos, that's the element of soul which comes from God, which is fundamentally disconnected from parents. But in the ultimate olam haba, in the ultimate olam haba, which is the experience of the body and soul together, so that element of neshama which comes from our parents also partakes of the bliss of olam haba, and because that's an element of soul which comes from our parents, so here the family connection exists. And that would be my conjecture. So if we have contradictory sources as to whether in the world to come is this a private experience, is it every tzaddik has the medur b'fnayatmo, is it an experience in which we are gathered unto our forefathers, we could make a distinction between the initial stage and the ultimate stage. In the initial stage, every tzaddik is a very private medor, because that is an experience of the element of neshama, which is disconnected from family. But in the ultimate, eternal world to come, after the tzchiyas 
which is the experience of body and soul, there every element of soul partakes, including the element which we derive from our parents, and therefore there we are gathered unto our fathers. Let's take it a step further. Now there's a very interesting sefer called the Gesher Achayim. The Gesher Achayim is a work on the laws of mourning. In the, in the second volume of the work, there is a chapter which is devoted to the travels of the soul. It's an amazing thing. Death is not an event. Death is a process. Now the truth is that uh, doctors will tell you the same thing. When a person dies, even in the physical sense, it's not that everything dies at once. Uh, there's a process of degeneration, the systems begin to break down, etc., etc., etc. But even in the spiritual sense, it's this way. And based on many quotations from the Zohar, he shows that there really are seven stages to the process of death. One begins several months before the person dies. Then there's a stage several hours before the so-called moment of death. Then there's the moment of death. Then three days after death, there's a further separation of the soul from the body. Then there's another stage seven days after, another stage 30 days after, ultimately 12 months after, this is when the soul totally forgets the body. Now this is a very, very frightening thing. I'll just mention one of the ramifications of it. You know, there are certain judgments that take place when a person dies. Whereas we talk about Eilam Habo being very, very blissful. But uh, it's not blissful right away necessarily. If you are a tzaddik gomor, if you're absolutely righteous, it may be blissful right away. But uh, if there are unatoned for sins, then there are judgments. One of the judgments is called chivut hakeva. Now the word chivut means the slamming down. If I would take a board and I slam it down, that's called chavata. Now when we bury a person, we think we lay the person down gently. Very, very, very gently, respectfully, you lay him down in the grave. But that's not what it feels like to the person. When you lay that person down, he feels chivotakever. He feels that he was banged down into the grave. That's the expression, chivotakever. Very frightening thing, what that means. Then there's another judgment. This is mentioned even in the Navi, called kaf hakela. Kafakela means a slingshot. You know, a slingshot is not the type of thing that uh, is in our experience. But we know David HaMelech, as a shepherd, used it. He defeated Goliath with a slingshot. So you have a stick, and uh, there's a little pouch, and there's a, a string that connects it to the stick, and you swing it around, and you throw the rock, and the rock goes flying and hits its target. That's a slingshot. So there's a punishment called kafakela. Kafakela means the soul flies from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe. It doesn't find rest. Very, very distressing. So what does this mean? Rav Desla Zechat Sadek Levracha brings from the Vilna Gon. It means like this. You know, in life, there are many different trials, many different tests. We are tempted by many different things. We have to overcome those temptations. But really, if you distill all the challenges to one basic challenge, it's the question of spirituality versus material pleasure. What are we living for? Are we living for self-indulgence, for pleasure, for fun, for amusement, 
or are we living for a higher purpose? And ultimately, everything boils down to that. This is the tension of the neshama and the guf, and the body. The neshama yearns for spirituality, it yearns for purpose, it yearns for meaning. The guf, the body, yearns for pleasure. Good food, good drink, amusement, etc. And the question is, is the person going to maintain the integrity of his soul, or will his soul become so entangled with his goof that even the soul, even the intellect, will become a servant of the body and become entangled with it? The guy writes, is a safer Evan Shlema, which is exerted from the Gon's writings, says that the Rishoyim, the wicked people, when the Malach Amabas, when the angel of death confronts the wicked people's souls, they don't want to come. They don't want to come. Because their souls are so entangled with this world that the idea of leaving this world and going to a world where there's no physical pleasure and no fun and nothing to eat is abhorrent. They don't want to come. And when the Malach Amabas confronts the souls of the Tzadikim, the sick say, we're ready to go. <coughs> we're ready to go. That's the difference. So if Dessler explains, that Chivot HaKever, the reason it's so painful to be laid in the, in the grave is because the Neshama doesn't want to leave this world. The Neshamas of the wicked. The Neshamas of the wicked want to stay in this world. And the Malach HaMavas tells the person, your time has come, your body is going to be laid in the grave, and your soul is going up to heaven. And the soul doesn't want to hear that. The soul does not want to hear that it's going to have its body buried and it's going to have to separate. It doesn't believe it. It doesn't take it seriously. No, it can't be. It can't be. You're going to bury my body and my soul is going to... So when is that moment of awareness? When does the soul finally realize, yeah, the body is being buried and the soul is going on? When you hear that thud, <laughs> when the body is put into the grave, that's when the Neshama realizes, oh boy, this is it. The body is being buried, my soul is going on, and that's terribly, terribly painful. That's the first judgment. Now the soul is separated. And the soul, you think, ah, oh, now the soul is in the oil of my MS, it's in the world of truth. So by this point, the soul certainly has given up all its past interests. So it's not true. It says, those souls that became so entangled with the material pleasures of this world, when they go on to the next world, they ask, uh, tell me, where's there a good restaurant here? <laughs> where can I go? And, uh, they say, we don't know of any restaurant here. So the soul says, well, let me go look and see. And the soul travels from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe, looking to satisfy its material desires. And it goes back and forth, looking, 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 <coughs> looking, no rest. And that's the kafakela. That's the slingshot. It's like you throw a stone and it flies across. So this is the ka It flies across the entire universe, looking, 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 going, going. That's the Kafa Kel. These are the demon, these are the, the judgments. But the Tzadikim are spared from this. Because the Tzadikim, who've kept their souls pure, kept their souls intact, when the time comes for them to leave the world, they're ready to go. And they approach death with serenity, with peace of mind. And they're exempt from these demon. Now, so there's seven stages of separation. The last happens after 12 months. But there's an amazing Zaya. There's an amazing Zaya which says, and the Geshe Chaim quotes this, that 
the lower element of the soul, which is bound to the body, remains with the body in the grave forever. The higher element of soul becomes totally separated, totally separated. But the lower element of soul remains attached to the body forever, because it's part of the body. Now, as we explained, it makes perfect sense. Because we see there are two elements of the soul. There's one element of the soul, which is the element that God injects into the body that was provided by the parents. But there's also the element of soul, which is a function of the contribution of the parents. So we understand. The part that God injected, that is the part which separates, goes on. The part which is an integral part of the body, that's the part which remains with the body even in the grave. Now we all know this. We all know that there must be some element of the soul which remains in the grave. Even after 12 months, even after 10 years. And how do we know this? Because we go to a grave site. Why do we go to Kvarais of Tzadikim? Why do we go to Kvarais of our parents? It must be. There must be something there. By the way, that's only for human beings. For animals, there is no such thing. When an animal dies, there is no eternal soul which remains. That's why the idea of a pet cemetery is really a, 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 a ludicrous idea. In other words, a person could have a very close emotional attachment to a pet, but there's nothing at the site of the grave. The, the neshama is not there in any sense. But in the case of human beings, says desire, that part of the neshama is, is there. So it comes down like this. That there are two elements of the, of the neshama. There's one part of the neshama, we said, which is part of the body. That is there at the grave forever. And then there's a part, the part that God injects, which through a process of seven stages is farther and farther and farther and farther and farther removed. So now we understand that the two halves of the Gemara and Brachas have nothing to do with each other. The first half of the Gemara <laughs> is discussing the question, if you're walking in a cemetery and you're wearing sitches, <coughs> Are you offending the aspect of neshama which is present at the cemetery? In other words, we're not talking about the idea of never wearing sitzes because you're going to offend the soul in heaven. The soul in heaven doesn't begrudge you wearing sitzes. Because we're talking about the neshama which is present in the cemetery. Or that aspect of the neshama which is attached to the body. So that, Rukhia says, that aspect of the neshama knows, it sees, it's very interested. It's very curious. Just like we are very curious. And if you were sitting here in the audience and you saw the person next to you was doing something very interesting, you'd be very distracted from the lecture to uh, watch what the person next to you was doing. That's natural. If something is going on right next to you, you can't, uh, of course you're going to be interested. So th that aspect of the neshama which is attached to the goof, is very, very interested in what's going on, so to speak, within its Daladamas, within its four cubits, in its meter proximity. So therefore the Gemara says, you gotta be careful. Don't do anything to insult that person. Don't wear your sisters out. Why? Because that element of Nisham, which is present in the cemetery, takes great offense. That's the first half of the Gemara. Now there's another half of the Gemara. The soul's in heaven. Do they know what's going on? So the sons of Rebchia are very, very far from Rebchia's grave. It's not a question of whether the element of soul in the cemetery sees what's going on. That element of soul is a thousand miles away. But the question is, the element of soul of Rebchia, which is in heaven, does it see what's going on? Well, that's a totally different question. Those souls in heaven, are they interested? Aren't they interested? It's a different question. But it's not related to the other question. In other words, the soul in the cemetery is very interested in what happens in its Dalad Amas. The soul in heaven, that's a good question. Is it interested? Is it not interested? Anyway, the Gemara has a discussion, back and forth. 
And Yonas and Ibishitz, in the Sefer Yaros Bavash, classic homiletic work, says that it really depends. It depends on the spiritual stature of that individual who passed down. Is if that spiritual person is really a very lofty person, then he'll only be interested in the most important things that are going on over here. If it's something which is trivial, he won't be interested. If he is a person who's, in a sense, corrupted in the Shama, then he'll be interested in the most trivial things happening over here. So, for example, let's say that you're eating in a restaurant and uh, they serve you the steak and uh, you ordered rare and it's well done. And you say, I'm sure that, that my father up in Shamayim is aware of the terrible distress this is causing me. <laughs> so you'd say, uh, that would be an insult to your father. To say that my father in heaven is concerned about whether whether my steak is well done or rare, he's doing more important things. That's not the kind of thing that uh, he should be concerned with. In fact, I think that if you go back to that Gemara, it says the sons of Rebchia had a hard time recalling their learning. So one said, oh, our father certainly knows this. Another one said, no, who says? That might be the issue over here. The one says, okay, we're not talking about a trivial thing. Being able to recall your learning is an important thing. Right? If we are distressed over that, certainly our father cares. The other one says, well, why? Why do you say that? It's good that it should be hard. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having to struggle. You know, the truth is that uh, if my son would call me from yeshiva, and he would say, Abba, now I'm learning this tasteless, I'm finding it very hard. Look, I, maybe I'm, I'm a heartless parent. I would say, good, it should be hard. <laughs> Why should it be easy? You work hard. You work hard, you'll figure it out. It's good for you. Right? So over here, the Bnei of Chia, it was hard. They had a hard time recalling their learning. So what did he think? Of, he's upset? Oh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it should be hard. But the things that are really important, right, the Tsarist of Klal Yisrael, the, the pain of Golos, the dangers that we face, those are things that are certainly of concern, even to those in the Lamas. And therefore, Klal Yisrael has this intuition. Even though the Gemara Bracha seems to come out that, that they don't know, but Klal Yisrael has an intuition that they do know. And we say it should be a man of Tziyosher, as we ask, they should daven for us, and they should intercede in the Kisei HaKovet. So, uh, didn't the Gemara say that they, they don't know? No, the Gemara is talking about those things that are, that are trivial. So the Gemara says, and therefore the souls are on such lofty levels, they're not interested in those trivial things. Says, but at a moment of great seriousness, and we understand that the Klal Yisrael faces unimaginably terrible dangers. So uh, these are certainly the issues that should be of great concern to those in heaven. And therefore, we understand there'll be Melitza Yaisha for us. Everything we said tonight is a conjecture. And uh, as all conjectures, very hard to confirm one way or the other. But the basic suggestion is that as we saw from the Ramban, there are two aspects to the Neshama of a human being. One that comes from our parents, and one which is a special gift from the Ribbana Shalaylam. In the immediate stage after our death, that part of the Neshama, which is a gift from the Ribbana Shalaylam, is in the Olam Neshamas, disconnected from family, because not where it is derived from. The neshama, which is connected to parents, is with the guf in the grave, and therefore the experience of 
Olam Hanashamas is something which is very, very private and very, very personal. The ultimate Chiyas HaMesim is the reunion. Because when we come together with body and soul, even that element of the Neshama, which comes from our parents, partakes of the bliss, and then we are all the Tzor HaChaim, we're all in the bundle of life. And again, the same thing, that that element of Neshama, which is part of the Guf, is of uh, great interest, very great concern for the things in its proximity. You have to behave in a cemetery, <coughs> right? But up in Shemayim, the element of soul which is there is only concerned with the most important things. But we have very, very pressing needs. And therefore, we hope that those lofty neshamas should be melitza yeshir, should intercede on our behalf, and hopefully they will pray before the kisei are covered, before the heavenly throne, that Kali Yisrael should know no pain, no sorrow, and uh, we should all be zaycha to the imminent gu'ula from Heir of Yemenu. Thank you for listening. I just wanted to say a few words, uh, thanks to Rabbi Breidowitz. Um, my father would often share with us uh, a frightening story that when he was in the ghetto during the war, there was a, uh, a pair of young, two young men who were taken by a train all the way to the concentration camps and they were able to jump off the train or somehow escape at the last minute and they came running back to the ghetto to tell everybody what was going on. And my father told us many times that no one believed these two people. No one believed what they came back to tell everyone else in the ghetto what was going on. And so, it may be difficult on some level for our souls to accept really what's going on with our body and for our body and soul to really somehow come together uh, in the way they're meant to be. But my prayer is that the clarity that Rebrida Witt shared with us tonight will help all of us not just prepare for the next world, but with the clarity that we have about what the next world is in terms of its relationship to this world and our souls, that our walk through this life itself will be with more clarity, with more purpose, uh, and God willing, we should all achieve our potentials, our soul's potentials. Uh, all of us should one day achieve the potential of our relationships both in this world and in the next world. And God willing, all of the davening that's going on now in the next world for us down here will help us all individually and especially as a nation. We all need our help. We need the help of, 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 our, of our loved ones and of Hashem. And so I want to thank Rabbi Breider with so much for giving me some strength tonight hearing these words. I'm hoping all of us derive some strength. And God willing, all of us should only come together as simchas, and we should all hear only Besorus Tavos.